we can now prove the Micklin theorem. We, we're going to have a technical lemma that we haven't proven yet, and I'm not going to prove it yet. We're just going to start the proof, and eventually we're going to get to something, and I'm going to say, okay, we're going to prove this later and come back to it. But, yeah. We have the ingredients for the, the main part of the proof. So what we want to show is this. And we want to show this for all compactly supported smooth functions. Want to show, that's what WTS stands for. We want to show this. And we're not going to show it directly. We're going to show it by duality. So by duality and density, it suffices to show for all, so for all F is above and for all G, we're gonna take a dualizing function G, which is also compactly supported and smooth, but valued in the dual space of Y. And it suffices to show this estimate here. So we bound by the LP norm of F and the LP prime norm, P primes with the holder conjugate, valued in Y star. Just testing against the, the dual of LP valued in Y, we know that that's LP prime valued in Y star. And we know that the compactly supported smooth functions are dense in that. So it suffices to test against compactly supported smooth functions and get this particular norm estimate here. So, we start to compute. Well, I don't have to write, we start to compute. We can just start to compute. So we take this thing we want to estimate. And the first thing we do, well, we write this out as M times F hat like that. Inverse, this is the definition of the Fourier multiplier. And we can write G as G, how do I want to write it out? Yeah. G inverse Fourier transform, Fourier transform. <laughs> like that. This is just using Fourier inversion, which is valid for compactly supported smooth functions. So there's an exercise in the notes that forces you to, forces, asks you to prove this. And then you have this thing that in, in Germany is called the dancing hat lemma for the Fourier transform. Tanzende Hut lemma or something, which says that when you have an integral an integral pairing of this form with Fourier transforms, you can take the hat from here and put it over there. <laughs> so this is M dot F hat G check. That's the dancing hat lemma. The best German name for a theorem. So where do we go from here? Now let's take the symbol M and we decompose it over all of the little Paley intervals. Makes sense that we do this because we have this R bound for all of these truncations. So we're gonna actually reduce down to that. And of course uh -huh. that sum over all the little Paley intervals can be written as the sum over the positive intervals plus the sum over the negative intervals of all of this stuff. All right. Uh, yep. When we have these uh, brackets, do they mean the uh, L two scalar product, or do they? Yeah, mean the, the, the integral, integral pairing the product. It's uh, so is it's there a, a bar combination on one of side? it's a comp Oh, sorry. Yeah, you said what you were going to say. Is there a bar on one side, or is there no bar on one side? There should be a bar, I think. And if that doesn't make sense, then there's no bar. Yes, I, <laughs> no. I mean, if, if there's if, it should if there's be this. R, I think a Fourier transform becomes a Fourier inverse because it's unitary, right? Actually, we, we don't need the bar explicitly because what I'm okay, what I mean by this, and maybe we should fix the notation accordingly, is oops, wrong color. I mean the integral of the, so this is y valued, this is y star valued. So it's the integral of the y, y star duality pairing. 
and this duality pairing is linear by assumption rather than conjugate linear. So this would be the equivalent of not having a bar on the G. So I might need to put a, a reflection or something in here to make this work. Do you know exactly how this should work? Uh, I think if there's, if it's just the product of F and G, then you probably can just pull over the Fourier transform because it kind of doesn't matter yeah. uh, where you put the integral. And if there's a bar, then the Fourier transform, I think becomes a Fourier inversion if you put it to the other side, because for yeah. the unitary, uh, the, the adjoint should be the inverse. I might need to swap that and that on G. Either it's true as written or you swap the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. One of these two formulas is true. I honestly cannot remember which one it is, but either one will work. <laughs> the proof will work either way. <laughs> Maybe just say that and I'll check it in more detail in the notes. Yeah, I mean, probably everything should be invariant under a sign flip and so it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe I need to put a reflection. Maybe I need to change a sign. Maybe I need to swap the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, but everything will work when you make the necessary changes. So I'll just make that little note here. That's important, but not too important. You could also just change G if you want to involve something like, anyway, we'll move on back to here. We're at this point here where we've got the sum over the positive and the negative intervals, and you deal with the, the positive part and the negative part in exactly the same way. So let's just do the positive part. The negative, the same proof works for both. I could write J plus minus everywhere if I wanted, nothing would change. So let's look at this positive part. Maybe this should be G hat rather than G check, as we said before, but it doesn't really matter. So we're going to write this as, well, before I give this next step, just a little bit of motivation for what this next step is about. Why would we do this next step? The bounds that we have that we need to use are the ones from this lemma here, which is a bound for Rademacher averages of convolutions of F with this function phi dilated in certain ways. And where we're at here, there's no function phi involved. We want to reduce things down to the function phi. So we're going to do the classic technique of just putting in phi and dividing by phi, and then dealing with all the error terms later on. So let's write this as this truncation of m. Let's put phi i hat f hat, because this is going to be the Fourier transform of phi i convolved with f. Uh, for G, we're going to want the same thing, but with an inverse Fourier transform, so that this is the inverse Fourier transform of phi i convolved with G, and we need to compensate, and we compensate like this. Does that make sense? I've just multiplied by some stuff and then divided by that stuff to, to compensate for it. And we're going to call this truncation of the symbol n. I'll define n in just a second. n is the sum of all little or Paley intervals or just the positive ones or just the negative, yeah, either all the positive or all, it doesn't really matter. It's the truncation of m divided by phi i hat, phi i check. Make sense? take this modified symbol, just give it a name, call it N. And then by doing the dancing hat lemma again, just that we did at the very start, this is the sum over I of the Fourier multiplier with symbol given by this truncation of N applied to the convolution phi I convolved with F that's paired against the convolution of phi I with G. Just putting the Fourier transforms back in. So now we're basically in the situation we were in at the very start, but now we've written it as a sum over all of the little Paley intervals. We've smuggled in these convolutions that weren't there before. 
at the cost of modifying the symbol. So instead of the original M, we now have this N, which is like a modification of M on every little of Paley interval. Now the technical lemma that I said we won't prove yet, but we'll prove later. We will show later that N is a Michelin symbol and that its Michelin norm is controlled by the Michelin norm of M. Just up to some constant that doesn't depend on anything, up to a universal constant. So we'll just assume that for now. We'll prove that after. The thing that we need to estimate is this sum First, I write out all of the terms. Okay. So remember, we have, well, you've probably forgotten, but remember, we have this Cauchy Schwartz theorem. No T in Cauchy Schwartz. Not actually the Cauchy Schwartz theorem, but the Cauchy Schwartz theorem for Rademacher averages. Or for Rademacher spaces. That says that this is less than or equal to the Rademacher norms, the product of the Rademacher norms of the two terms in each sum end. So we can write it out like this. So Rademacher norm indexed by J plus times this Rademacher norm also indexed by J plus. But now this is valued in LP prime of the dual space of Y. This is something that followed from independence of Rademacher variables. Nice little probabilistic argument that says you can basically do a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, but instead of having L2s, you have Rademacher spaces. So now we know how to bound these terms. We've got constants depending on P and X and Y. In the first term, we use the R boundedness of truncations of Michelin symbols of Fourier multipliers with symbols given by truncations of Michelin symbols. So we get the Michelin norm of N times this Rademacher average of all of those convolutions. That should be X, not Y. Wait, hang on. Sorry. This is Y. This is X. And we have the corresponding term for G. We do nothing on that yet. So that's using this lemma that we proved before. R boundedness of truncations of Michelin symbols over the little Paley intervals. And then we use the lemma from before that says these Rademacher averages are controlled by the norms of F and G. Constants depending again on X and Y and P. And we also use that the, the Michelin norm of N is controlled by the Michelin norm of M. And we are done. That's what we needed to prove. Nice and simple. This technique of dualizing and splitting onto certain sets and then bounding your thing by a Rademacher average and then controlling the right marker averages using R bounds and then some estimates like what we had in this lemma up here. It's a pretty common pattern in harmonic analysis. It's also reasonably common in this Barnack valued harmonic analysis. I mean, if you're doing it scalar valued, then you don't have right marker averages. You have little L2 sums everywhere. But here we do need to deal with right marker averages because you know Barnack valued stuff, we need right marker averages all the time. So that's the proof of the Michelin theorem up to this little technical lemma, which is important. All these little technical lemmas are always very important in harmonic analysis. <coughs> We've replaced our symbol with a different symbol. We need to show that that different symbol is bounded by the original one. Everything just reduces down to boundedness of things by other things in some form. So let's prove the technical lemma. Uh, what do I need to say about N? Yeah, X and Y are complex Barnack spaces. We don't need the UMD property here because just bounding N by M doesn't 
use anything about the Barnack spaces actually. M is a Meeklin symbol. I won't write everything down. Phi as above. So remember phi is the Haar function convolved with its reflection. Then the symbol N defined like this. Uh, phi I hat, phi I check is a Michelin symbol. And its norm is controlled by the norm of N. That's what we have left to prove. And this is basically an explicit computation using the explicit form of phi. Okay, we don't say what phi is other than the fact that it's this convolution of a half function with its own reflection, but we use that explicitly to do this. Also, I'm not gonna be very sharp about what the optimal constant here is. You can compute it much more explicitly than what I'm gonna do, but I'm just gonna show that there is some finite constant such that this works, that's good enough for me. So first we just use a fact that I didn't mention, but you can prove it easily enough. Uh, the Michelin norm of a product is the product of the Michelin norms. You can believe that if I tell you. The Michelin norm is just the, a uniform bound and L infinity norm of a product is a product of L infinity norms, or at least it's bounded by that. And you have this scale invariant derivative term. And if you do the product rule, you see, okay, the derivative of this product, you've got the Leibniz rule, you can do all of the bounds, everything will work out. So this is actually the product of three terms. You've got M, you've got this sum, Ooh, that's a bit of a mess. You've got this term here. And you have this term here. N is just the product of these three symbols, if you check on every interval. So the Michelin norms controlled by the product of the Michelin norms. This kind of dependence on M is exactly what we want. We just need to check the norms of these. And now there's nothing vector valued anymore. This is purely the Michelin norm of a scalar valued symbol. So by, you've got some dilation invariance and you've got reflection invariance of the Michelin norm. You've got that this norm that you need to control is actually equal to the other norm that you need to control because one is actually just a reflection of the other because the inverse Fourier transform is just a reflection of the Fourier transform. So you don't really have to bound two separate norms. It's just the same thing squared. Now this norm, if you write out what the Michelin norm is on scalar valued symbols, there's no R bounds. It's just a uniform bound. So it's a supremum over all of the Littlewood Paley intervals. And in fact, you can just consider the positive ones because this phi sub i is just a dilation according to the size. It doesn't care whether the interval is positive or negative. It's a supremum over Littlewood Paley intervals of, of this norm. So you can check every interval, interval individually. And because these terms are actually all just dilations of one common term, it turns out, it suffices to check the interval from one half to one. <laughs> and phi sub that interval is actually just phi because you're dilating phi by two times the length of the interval. This interval has got length one half. So you're dilating by one, that's nothing. So all you need to do is check this thing. And that we check by hand. So by definition, this is the supremum over psi between one half and one. Um, this should be a half open interval, it doesn't really matter. Of the uniform bound of the symbol. So that's this term here, plus psi times the derivative of that thing. So let's write it like this. We have to bound this thing explicitly. Let's just simplify that derivative. Well, half open interval. Q 
keep the first term as is and do the differentiation using the chain rule or however you want to do this quotient rule would also work. It's calculus, it doesn't matter. I checked it earlier. Does that look right to everybody? I didn't do that in my head. I did that before I copied it from my notes, but I'm going to do it in my head again. What if I minus one phi squared? Yeah, but no, that's fine. That works. So we want to bound this. And one way you can do it is explicitly compute what phi hat is and write it out. You're going to get a bunch of trigonometric functions. You get like a sign to the four and stuff like that. And the, the key thing is there's a denominator that you need to show is bounded away from zero so that the thing doesn't blow up. If you want to get explicit constants, you compute it explicitly. You do a bunch of optimization. You find the maximum. You get something that's like pi squared on something. But, you know, we're, we're not going to do it so explicitly. I'm, I'm more lazy than that. So we're going to say, okay, phi, what do we know about phi? It's bounded and has compact support. Uh, you can, it's a convolution of a half function with itself. You can see that that would have to have compact support. It's like a slightly smoothed out half function. That's all you need to know. It's bounded, it's got compact support. So phi hat is C1. I don't know if you can say more than that, C1 certainly. So these terms in the, in the numerator, hang on, I need to say that's bounded. C1 and bounded, I should say. Phi is integrable, so phi hat's bounded. That's not a problem. Its derivative is also going to be bounded. All right. So this term in the numerator is bounded. So you do, I don't care what the bound is, but it is bounded. We just need to show that these denominators never become zero in this range. We need to show that phi hat of psi is not zero for all psi in the closure of that interval. So all psi between one half and one. And that'll do, we don't need explicit bounds. We just need to show that this thing's not zero, which is far more fun to do. What do we know about phi hat? Phi is H convolved with reflection of H hat. And Fourier transforms of convolutions are just products of the Fourier transforms. That's what the reflection does. So we need to show that this is not zero for psi between one half and one. So really all we need to do is compute the Fourier transform of the half function. Now the half function is just a sum, a linear combination of characteristic functions. It's a characteristic function from zero to one half. So we get the Fourier transform of that minus the characteristic function from one half to one. So we have a Fourier transform there. If you're good with Fourier analysis, you recognize these as sync functions uh, or modulated sync functions, but we don't even need to do that. We're just gonna say, right, let's compute what the Fourier transform of the integral from zero to one half is. It's the integral from zero to one half of this exponential. And then we have minus the integral from one half to one of the same exponential. And we know how to differentiate exponentials. So we know how to integrate exponentials. This is nice and easy. Let's write it out like this. E to the minus two pi i x i divided by minus two pi i x i. So let's put that minus out the front. Evaluated at x equals zero and x equals one half. You know, this is how you do indefinite integration or whatever. Plus the same thing. but now x goes from one half to one, high school calculus. Let's take out the two pi i xi because it doesn't affect anything. What do we get here? e to the minus pi i xi minus one because that's what happens when x equals zero here, minus e to the minus two pi i uh, xi plus e to the minus pi i xi. Anybody disagree with that? High school exercise again. 
And I'm going to write that as one on two pi i xi e to the minus two pi i xi minus two times e to the minus pi i xi plus one. Now, how do you know that this thing's not zero? Well, the denominator is not going to make things zero. That's not going to be a problem. We just need to check that this is not zero. And how do you show that this is not zero? Does anybody have a clever answer for me? <laughs> There's a number of ways you can show that this is not zero. I've got my favorite way. I think there are other ways. It's a square, yeah. Sorry? It's in the tab, it's a square. It's a square. Is it a square? Oh, it is a square. It is a square, actually. I, I can't see that immediately, but the way that I would prove it. Okay, this is a square, unless psi is, what, zero or something like that? No. If psi is a multiple of two pi, then this thing is going to be zero, but otherwise it's not. Anyway, here's, here's how I do it. I would write this as e to the minus pi i psi squared minus two e to the minus pi i psi plus one. That's a quadratic equation in e to the minus pi arc psi. You can use a quadratic formula. So this has to be equal to what? Negative b plus or minus b squared. No, hang on. Yeah. Plus or minus b squared minus 4ac on 2a. That vanishes. That's one. Right. Now, when is this complex exponential equal to one? <laughs> If and only if psi is in, if only if psi is an even number. All right. Which doesn't happen if psi is between one half and one. <laughs> that completes the proof. All right. That's how I'd do it anyway. There's other ways to show this. You can do it geometrically as well. You know, seeing these things as being, sorry these complex exponentials as being on the unit circle and just doing a little bit of geometry, you can say, right, that's only going to happen if psi is an even integer. I see Christoph has just arrived. Christoph, do you have a clever proof for me that this quantity oh. here is not zero unless psi is an even integer? <laughs> Well, is it a square? No, it's not. It is. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. Okay. I did it by quadratic formula, and you see from the quadratic formula that this discriminant vanishes. So, it's, you know. Yes, and then yeah. it's a square of a cosine, no? Something like this? Yeah, it must be something like that. And then if you know that, then you know the zeros somehow. Yeah. Uh, cool. I just, I know there are clever okay. geometric proofs of this. And uh, I wonder well, whether people would see that. I just, I just chimed in. I'm not quite sure. Uh, yeah, what, where this comes from? Maybe. Oh, this, uh, it's Fourier transform of a half function. Ah. I needed to know that it doesn't yeah. vanish, or at least I needed to know that this function, half function times reflection of yeah. half function Fourier transform, doesn't vanish for psi between one half and one. Okay, it's a nice one. I'll think about it, but I don't have anything on the spot. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the proof that was done for the is a square of some cosine. Is that what we figured out? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, just yeah, about. yeah, just the half function. And here you actually have the half function's Fourier transform times itself or times its reflection. So you have something even different. Ah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. All of this was just showing. Actually, I should remind us what we're actually proving here. We had a Michelin symbol M we had this phi, which was the convolution of H and its reflection. And we took this modified symbol and wanted to show that the Michelin norm of that was controlled by that of M. So you really just end up having to control this. And in the denominator, you get this phi hats that you need to show don't vanish. So then you end up computing this. Mm -hmm. The way this is done in the analysis in Barnack Spaces book is they explicitly compute it and they give an explicit upper bound because what I get yeah. is just a non-constructive upper bound. <laughs> because it's a bit easier and a bit more fun. You don't want to be estimating the sign to the four explicitly. That's mm -hmm. not, to me, that's not interesting, but you know, some people like doing that. Yeah. All right, nice, but I don't have anything intelligent to add at this point. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah. okay. Good. So yeah, we just finished the proof of the Michelin theorem, incidentally. Is 
you arrived just then, right? You didn't see the proof of the Mikvan theorem? I really just came in. I was afraid I might kick you out again because I have this sometimes, but I didn't. Yeah. Or I did. And but so, it's working. It's working. Yeah. So partially for your sake, and just as it, because it's good to have this reminder, here was how he proved the Mikvan theorem. Because that was okay. a technical lemma in the middle of the proof. Just the broad lines of the proof. Prove it by duality. Split up your symbol into the these little wood Paley intervals. Intervals from 2 to the j, 2 to the j plus 1. Uh, smuggle in the functions phi, for which we have a nice Rademacher function estimate. And that means you have to look at the symbol here. Once you know that that's a Michelin symbol, you can say, okay, I've got truncations of this Michelin symbol. And we know from the lemma that we proved in the last hour that they are R bounded. So you've got this thing by duality, control it by a product of two Rademacher norms, use the R boundedness of the truncations of the Michelin symbol, use the estimate for phi, the square function estimate that comes from the dyadic shifts, and you're done. That's how you do it. So you did something before. If you have a Michelin symbol that's supported between one and two, say, then you have bounds. Is you have R bounds for all of these things. So if you have a, a fixed Michelin symbol, yes, in fact, it doesn't even need. Oh yeah, if you have a fixed Michelin symbol and then you truncate it to all of these dyadic intervals, the little right. crazy ones, that collection yes. is R bounded. That you did. Right? Yeah, that we did in the previous hour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. That was the, no. the key thing. And that reduces down to our boundedness of the Fourier projections. Yes. Which reduces down to the Hilbert transform. Yeah. Which you did last time, right? Which we did last time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Nice. You've been you're up to speed now. You're good. Um, uh, <laughs> I feel like all was up to speed. Yes. <laughs> I feel like this is good for the other students too, because then you get to at least uh, see what yeah. we did more than once. <laughs> right. Because yeah. no, it's a no, bit confusing it's... the first time, but then once you come back and look at it again, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. yeah. Good. Right, so there's still a bit more to do today. We're not done yet, but we don't have much left. It's a little bit of a short lecture. Last thing we're going to do is a little bit Paley theorem, which is pretty much an immediate consequence of the Michelin theorem in this setting. Right, so little bit Paley theorem uh, in the scalar valued setting says if you have an LP function, you can recover its LP norm by looking at the LP norms of Fourier projections combined through a square function. If you know harmonic analysis, you know this theorem. If you don't know it, here's the, the Barnack valued version. X is a complex UMD space. P is between one and infinity. Then for all LP functions F, the LP norm is equivalent up to a constant depending on P and X to the Rademacher average of the Fourier projections onto all Littlewood Paley intervals. So just to write out that Rademacher average, because this is an important theorem. That too is not important. Right. This is Littlewood Paley theorem and I'll just write one little consequence. If X is a Hilbert space, for example, you can write this as this square function where the L2 sum is inside the LP norm because that's how Rademacher averages behave. Of course, when you're proving this in the scalar valued setting, you don't need Rademacher averages, you don't need R bounds, you don't need any of these Barnack valued things, but in full generality we do. And phrasing it in terms of the Rademacher average is the natural way to do it. It follows in the Michelin theorem fairly simply. So let's consider a scalar valued symbol. It's called uh, M. Alex, uh, yep. that would be X equal to Hilbert space? Yeah, Hilbert space is the same thing. Although then, yeah, yeah, it works for Hilbert space as well. You have to formulate this sum maybe slightly differently because you need to be able to square the vectors here. So this is an, this here's an element of LP. And then I have a notion of the absolute value of an element of LP or the square of an element of LP and so on. Uh, for an abstract Hilbert space, you don't have that. But when that Hilbert space is L2, you can do this. And in fact, if X is, um, do I want to say it like this? No, I don't. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll stick with that. 
if your Hilbert space is L2, this makes perfect sense. If it's just an abstract Hilbert space, you still need to make sense of, of these things here. Uh, oh, Although you could actually, then you, you could still put, um, yeah, the L2 norms on the inside, it would still be fine. Yeah, uh, let me write Maybe like you version. can use it, use the result that every Hilbert space is isometrically isomorphic to L2S for some set S. You can do that, but then you need to choose what the isometric isomorphism is, so. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is an easier way to do it. You can literally just take the norms on the inside if you have a Hilbert space, and this will work okay. Because when you yeah. have a, a Rada marker average of an LP space, you can always say that okay, this is always equivalent to LP with the Rada marker space on the inside. That's an exercise in the notes somewhere. That's even an exam question. Spoilers. That's an exam question. All right. Um, yeah, so let's prove it. Let's get back to the proof. So we have a scalar valued symbol we consider, which is quite simple. We consider the sum over all little wood Paley intervals of the indicator of the interval times a sub i, where a sub i is arbitrarily plus or minus one. So you take a sequence of signs and make a symbol out of it then this is a Michelin symbol. It's bounded. It, it's differentiable on, on every little bit Paley interval. The derivative vanishes, so you don't have to worry about boundedness conditions of the derivative. So M is a Michelin symbol. So you can say, right, this sum over all little bit Paley intervals of A sub I times Fourier projection of I of F. This is actually just the LP norm of T sub M of F for this particular choice of M. And that's bounded by the LP norm of F. This is step one. For an arbitrary choice of signs, you have an estimate here. If you apply this to the function G, which is given by applying, okay, G is T sub M of F, then what you find is that T sub M of G is bounded by G. But T sub M of G, this is T sub M of T sub M of F and M squared is one, so it's the identity operator. So T sub M of G is equal to F. And this is, is that. So you get the reverse estimate as well every choice of signs. So what you've got is that the LP norm of F is equivalent to taking the Fourier projections and summing them with arbitrary signs for all choices of signs A. This is actually stronger than the Littlewood Paley estimate. <laughs> then what you do is you average over all choices of signs by taking, you know, the probability one half plus or minus one uniformly for each of the signs. This is just replacing the signs A with a Rademacher sequence. You do the L2 average of that Rademacher sequence, you're done. That's the whole proof. This follows pretty much directly from Micklin. As I said, this estimate where you have this for every choice of signs A, this is sort of stronger than the Littlewood Paley theorem. But the conclusion with Rademacher averages, it's a lot more amenable to actual analysis because you can then talk about R bounds and things like that and how they interact with the Rademacher sums and, and actually use that. The same is true in the scalar valued setting. Like you have this square function characterization, but you can also say for every choice of signs A, the norm of F is equivalent to the norm of this Fourier multiply with that symbol M coming from A. But you don't really use that in practice. You use the fact that if you have this for all A's, you can average and you can use Kinchin's inequality and get the square function in there. Much more useful. That's the Lord Paley. That's all I need to say about Little Lord Paley. Um, one thing I will say about Little Lord Paley actually, but because we have the time to, this is all just side notes here. If you take this Little Lord Paley estimate, 
which looks like this. This Fourier projection here is actually a convolution operator. Every Fourier multiplier is a convolution operator, by the way, I haven't said that, but I think most of you know that already. This is a convolution operator of F with the Fourier transform of the symbol of this multiplier. That's just how Fourier multipliers work. And the Fourier transform of one of these characteristic functions ends up being a modulated sinc function. So what is it? It's sine x on x. I probably need some two pi factors that I've forgotten. Something like this this week, or a sinc function uh, multiplied by e to the two pi i, e to x for some eta. Eta, depending on how large its interval is. So you have the scale of the interval that matters. You have intervals from two to the j to two to the j plus one, and that eta will depend on j. Um, I've got some multiplications that I've forgotten here. The, the key thing is this is a modulated sinc function. And what this looks like, it's basically it looks like this. It's, it's one at the origin and then it decays like one on X, but it's got a bit of modulation in there, bit of frequency content. Now we also have this estimate that came from the dyadic shifts. where you had this function phi sub i, where phi was half function convolved with its reflection. And we had a Rademacher average estimate for that. And if you compare these two estimates we have, so one with the Fourier projections, so convolutions with sinc type functions, and one which is convolutions with dilations of phi, Remember how phi looked, phi looks like this, which looks a lot like a discrete sinc function, doesn't it? It's got a little bit of oscillation. It's got some decay. It's got quite good decay. It's actually compactly supported, but it looks like a sinc function. So what's happening is that this estimate we had here that came from the dyadic shifts, that's already a little bit Paley type theorem, but with particular types of convolutions, which are not so directly related to Fourier projections. But in the little Paley theorem, we can actually get Fourier projections or convolutions with these sinc functions, but we have to work a little bit harder. You can't directly get them from dyadic shifts. You have to do the whole Micklin thing that we did, or at least work with these Micklin symbols for each choice of sign. So from the Fourier analytic point of view, these, these estimates here with Fourier projections or sinc functions, these are much more natural than the ones with these weird piecewise linear hats, but philosophically they're the same thing. So basically from dyadic shifts, we already had a kind of Littlewood Paley theorem, but not the natural one. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. And yeah, we didn't explicitly use the form of this function anywhere. It's just, if you do compute it and draw it, it looks sort of like that. So that's just nice to know. Now, I won't finish yet, I'll just say a couple more things. What do we know now about UMD and various Fourier analytic properties? Just to draw some implications between everything. So the UMD property implies boundedness of the Hilbert transform. Let's call that HT. We know also that it implies the Mifflin theorem. So that essentially followed from boundedness of the Hilbert transform, but we did implicitly use UMD by itself through this dyadic shift estimate. And we have the Littlewood-Paley theorem and the Micklin theorem directly implies that. So if you just assume that the conclusion of the Micklin theorem holds, you can prove the Littlewood-Paley theorem. And if you use the Littlewood-Paley theorem or the Micklin theorem, and the Fourier multiplier representation of the Hilbert transform, you can show that assuming the Littlewood-Paley theorem implies boundedness of the Hilbert transform, and likewise, assuming the Micklin theorem implies boundedness of the Hilbert transform, just using the Hilbert transform is a Fourier multiplier with a Micklin symbol. You can also use Littlewood-Paley to prove Micklin <laughs> if you like the R bounds come in a bit more directly there because you say, okay, I've got the norm of TM of F. 
I decompose that on individual little or Paley intervals, and then I use other results. So it starts to look like all these things are equivalent. And of course they are, because what we're going to prove in the next week is that boundedness of the Hilbert transform implies the UMD property. So in the end, all of these things are equivalent. You can take any one of these as an assumption and everything else will follow. You can assume UMD and you get all of the Fourier analytic properties you like. You can just assume the Littlewood Paley theorem and you get all of the Fourier analytic properties you like and all of the probabilistic properties that you like. You can assume any of these and you get all of them, which is great. Uh, so anyway, this thing we prove next week will take the whole week. <laughs> it's quite difficult. And we're going to do it by introducing another property called dyadic UMD, which is the UMD property, but only for martingales on the unit interval with the dyadic filtration. So it's a very restricted UMD property. And trivially UMD implies dyadic UMD. Dyadic UMD is weaker than UMD. We're gonna first prove that they're equivalent, which is tricky. And then we'll show that the Hilbert transform implies dyadic UMD. This is the key thing. You've got the Hilbert transform on one side, the UMD property on the other, and you just gradually bridge the gap between them from both ends. You're also gonna reduce the Hilbert transform to something else. Hilbert transform on the torus. <laughs> We're gonna to prove that the Hilbert transform boundedness implies the boundedness of the Hilbert transform on the torus go from that to dyadic UMD. And then we're gonna have a whole zoo of equivalent properties in the end. And yeah, once you know that all these things are equivalent, you can really start to work with the UMD property because you can just use your favorite characterization of it. it makes it relatively easy to prove or to, to prove things from. It makes the theory you know, nice and rich. And yeah, I think that's all I need to say. Are there any questions? Yeah, no, no question, but the, since you have the sync function drawn, I'll just, sometimes I like to make, a, how do you say, aktuelle Stunde or something like this in German, where you say something. So the sync function, there's a famous Vyasovska function that looks like it. Though the sync function has zeros on the integers, right? And its Fourier transform is the characteristic function of the interval. So it has lots of zeros, has infinitely many zeros. Now you could try to make a compromise where the function looks exactly like its Fourier transform. And there is one that looks like this on the picture. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but the zeros live more on the, am I saying this right, on the squares or was it the square roots? No, I, to, uh, I think it might be on the, the square. No, I can't remember. I don't really yeah. know this stuff. One of them, one of them. If I think for longer, I can remember. And then it's exactly the same as the Fourier transform. And it is, um, it plays out important role proving a sphere packing problem in 12 dimensions, I suppose. I it but it turns out there's this 90. 24 or 12. Both, I believe. Both. And, okay. uh, or, or was it eight? Eight, 12, 24. Oh, I, maybe even, dimensions. I think it might relate to eight. I can't remember. This is yeah, not my field. The yeah. problem is trivial in one and two dimension and three dimension it was a very tough proof. Uh, and now it's solved in, in a few more such as eight, 12, and two out of eight, 12 and 24, I would say. Um, and it's just, it's really a remarkable simple Fourier analysis just, and it turns out to be just a basic function that needed to be constructed. That was the hard part using modular forms yeah. But basically, a function like this looking exactly like the Fourier transform, uh, but the zeros yeah. are, and we said square roots are squares, one of the two. Just one of the yeah. Look it up. yeah. And, and it, it turns out there's actually um, folks in our group, such as Felipe Gonzalez, working on this type of function. These, are, these tend to be extremizers of certain problems. Yeah. For example, you could try to do the following you could try. All right, you could try to have a function which has a positive bump like the sin function, uh, but beyond the first zero, maybe it's always negative or non-positive. Then you could like try this, to make like... that bump as wide as possible, something, right? Yeah. It, it's, it still touches the line infinitely often, so it still has lots of zeros. But oh, it's, right. like, yeah. it's always non-positive, so what it does, that's quite weird. That's right, exactly. Yeah. And then this is actually, this looks like the Vyasovska function. Right? And there's, there's similar functions and they, 
it's also an extreme extremizing properties and then you use them in number theory where the better you extremize your property the better estimates you get in your number theoretic problem so it's a it's, a, it's an active area around it's touching upon the folks in Bonn and, uh, and that's my sort of aktuelle Stunde. <laughs> Sorry, it's not much about UMD or so. Uh, I'm still not exactly sure what aktuelle Stunde means. Aktuelle Stunde, okay. Aktuelle Stunde means you interrupt the flow of things to talk about something that's uh, sort of aktuell. Aktuell means... Uh, current events. <laughs> you know, just because... You, we could also talk about the Biden inauguration. That would also be an aktuelle Stunde. Right? I see, yeah. <laughs> That is a bit less relevant to this map. It's even less relevant. Well, this I've just sort of I'm prompted by. Maybe relevant to the fact I had a pretty good sleep last night. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that could be yes. Yeah. That results in a good lecture. This would be the. Yeah. I would say maybe the, not necessarily the first positive effect, but one of the early positive effects. Yes. That's right. Yes. I mean, I was thinking about the square we. But just when I logged in and we talked about this square, yeah. but this was just a square because it was sort of the Fourier transform of a convolution product of something with itself, right? Or yeah, I mean, the in the end we had this. It wasn't a square because of that. I mean, we have this thing which is like a square, but then this thing, a square, appears in that individual term. In fact, okay, yeah, you actually get a fourth power when you put everything together. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, I okay, I should not say too much because I, I didn't even watch the yeah. full calculation. Yeah. Actually, this, the thing I like about this calculation and the reason I did actually present this calculation in full is it's like the, the babiest of baby versions of the link between number theory and Fourier analysis. Because for, for some Fourier analytic reason, you need to know that a function is bounded and that reduces down to just knowing that there are no zeros in a certain region and that resulted down to a quadratic equation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and if that mm -hmm. can come up, then of course, much deeper links between Fourier analysis and number theory can come up. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not a number theorist, so I can't say anything about them. <laughs> the flavor tastes like it, though. Yeah, things yeah. come up in theory. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is used in the proof of the standard Michelin theorem. This isn't even a vector value thing. This is just straight Fourier analysis. I thought it was just too nice to, to skip. The funny thing is you don't see this nice thing if you compute if you compute the constant explicitly. That annoys me about computing explicit constants sometimes. Sometimes you prove a weaker result, but the proof is more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I guess that's what I have. Yeah. To say here. Yeah, that's a nice point. Sorry, I came late today. I had this every Thursday. I come yeah, usually late days, and yeah. today it was extreme. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'll release the exam questions at some point today if Christoph approves of them. Yeah, I, um, yeah, sure. I had a quick look. Yeah, no, just go ahead and release. Okay, yeah. then I'll release it yeah. in ten minutes. In that case, if you're fine with it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. All right. That's all. Office hours tomorrow, as usual, if you want to come. Next lecture's on Tuesday. Uh, only three weeks left, so we're nearly there.